Welcome to Interviewed by a Vampire. My guest this episode is photographer and author Kyle Cassidy. His work has appeared in Vanity Fair, Time Magazine, Newsweek, and numerous other media outlets on both sides of the pond. His subjects have ranged from gun owners to librarians and everything in between. And he's taken photographs of the Dalai Lama, George R. R. Martin, and too many other famous people to list. Kyle, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, so, someone saw your book, mm. Armed America, on my coffee table. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, look, there it is. There it is. Uh, right there on my coffee table. And, you know, she's flipping through the book and she said to me, um, so what's this guy's agenda? Is he trying to normalize the presence of guns in homes? And I said, well, if you know anything about Kyle's work, He's trying to normalize the presence of cats in homes because pretty much every photo you take, you try to find some way to squeeze a pet in there. Is that a fair uh, assessment of your work? Well, I think um, that when I went into this, I wanted to do uh, family portraits. And my conceit behind it, the thing that I told myself was that I had been sent out to photograph lottery winners. So that's what I was thinking in my head. How, how so? Because I just wanted to, to, I wanted to make the portrait the first thing and the gun the incidental thing. And so I thought that if I did a family portrait of, if somebody did a family portrait of me and I'd won the lottery, I'd like, I want my cat in here. Because like my cat's really important to my life. You know? <laughs> okay, all right. You know, the, the, the winning the lottery might not be, it might uh, not be that important to my life. So um, I photographed uh, people trying to sort of capture what their lives were. And I know that, you know, if a lot of those people had a gun, but the gun wasn't, the, you know, the major part of their life. It was a thing that they had. And it was sort of like, in some places it was like, you know, hey, can I come and photograph you with your, your hammer or your bandsaw or your, right? Your leaf blower. Right, exactly, right. So some people were like, yeah, whatever. I think I got one of those in the garage. So um, I didn't want to draw attention to that. I wanted to draw attention to the people. And I think that m many people are so attached to their, to their pets that it just seemed obvious thing to have the, the pets in there. There are actually more dogs than cats, but people seem to notice the cats more. Yeah, I, I definitely, you know, I, I, I had remembered more cats, but maybe <laughs> after we're done with this, I'll go back yeah. and do a tally. So, um, but you know, there are people who have said, you know, what's his agenda, mm -hmm. not just with this book, but with other books. Do, do any of your books really have an agenda? And what's maybe the most off-base accusation mm. you've received about having an agenda in your work? Well, I try not to be a storyteller in most, most of my documentary work. I try to help other people tell their stories. So I want to you know, provide a platform or a window that people can look in through into lives that, that they don't normally get to see. So there are, I don't know, 250 people in that book or whatever, and I'm the only person on earth who's met all of them. So this is, you know, a window that I have onto a particular world that I could let people look through. And I was really lucky in the first week that the book came out. I was really worried, really worried uh, when it came out uh, how it was going to be taken because mm -hmm. I had no idea because, you know, I'd been living... Uh, by myself with all this, so I knew. And, and this is what year, just to give people context. Okay. So I knew it was in my head, um, but I didn't know how other people were going to look at it. And the week that it came out, the Washington Post gave it a really positive review, and Field and Stream gave it a really positive review, like on the same day. And I was like, "All right, <laughs> that's a good sign." I was like, "All right, just put these two quotes on everything, you know, and and we're good." So um, I th I think it did a really good job of hugging this sort of puzzled center line when people looked at it, trying to figure out. And I, I think that people in the news, like you should look, you should look at your news anchor person and say, I wonder how that person votes. Like it shouldn't be obvious, right? right? I mean, if you're doing it right. Right. If you're doing it right, that person's uh, opinion should not appear on their face or in their work. So what's, what's sort of the craziest accusation somebody's made about an agenda you've been advancing? Yeah, so there was one person whose house I got to, uh, to photograph her, and she was somewhere in cent Central America. For which project? For, this is for Armed America. And her father had sent her this like 10-page handwritten letter about how I was obviously working for the government, and I was making a list of gun owners, and it was, you know, the step one of gun confiscation. And it was, I mean, it was a very, very sincere note that mm -hmm. he had written his daughter warning her not to, uh, not to talk to me. So I think that's 
you know, that's the most uh, probably off base of any of any of my things. Because I felt really bad. I felt bad that, you know, that I was causing him distress because that obviously, you know, if, if you want to find a list of gun owners, you, you probably buy the... Uh, the list of people who subscribe to Guns and Ammo, right? <laughs> <laughs> They'll sell it to you, right? You know? <laughs> so, like me going one by one, you know, door to door, finding you know 250 gun owners over three years, <laughs> right? Probably not. not the most efficient way to confiscate the guns, <laughs> right? So, yeah, that was the most. Okay, so you know, there's obviously there's there's a gun subculture. Mm -hmm. um, you've been part of the goth subculture mm -hmm. and, and and other subcultures. You did uh, a book about. Um, how tattoos are a part of the mm -hmm. military subculture. Out of all these groups, and you know, the, there's there's other groups that you've you've mm -hmm. worked with that you haven't published books on. Right, right. Um, you you did uh, orphans in Romania. Was mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Were they uh, street children in Romania? Yeah. Um, uh, Ceausescu, Nicolae Ceausescu, in the in the eighties in Romania had this plan to double the population of the country in a certain number of years uh, because he th you know thought that Romania was politically or popul populistically underpowered. And the infrastructure didn't exist in the country to support it. So at the time, there were thousands of homeless kids living in the storm sewers underneath uh, Bucharest. And so I photographed uh, some of those kids and spent some time um, in the storm sewers. So out of all of those groups, mm -hmm. out of all those subcultures, which one was the hardest for you to kind of get your foot in the door with? Fraternities. That's something I've been working on for a couple of years now, for doing portraits of people who live in Greek rat houses. And it's not because they're not interested in it. It's just because uh, it just seems to be, <laughs> oddly, inherently disorganized, so that you would talk to one person <laughs> and, you know, Nobody, nobody would get back to you, or they wouldn't know who the other person was, or like nobody was around. So it was, uh, it's been <laughs> like pulling teeth. Just change your Facebook profile to a busty blonde. They'll, I promise you, they'll get back to you in, in 15 minutes. I don't think that has much to do with it. I think, I think what, what it has to do with more is that people are busy doing stuff. And then when you have 15 people living in a house, even deciding who's going to do the dishes or whatever is kind of a... A difficult uh, thing. So who's going to answer the house email? I think, and who's sure. going to who's going to be the one to say, "Hey, you guys need to be here on Tuesday at five thirty because this guy's coming over." So that's been the hardest part. And I've found that the easiest way to do it is actually through the alumni board. So you have people who graduated eight years ago, and they're still sort of you know helping out um, their fraternity. And if you contact them, they're usually. That's, that's been the easiest way in. Um, one of the things that I learned very early on in my documentary photography career from Mary Ellen Mark, who is a wonderful documentary photographer who's no longer with us, um, was that everything is easier if you have somebody on the inside helping you. Sure. And so, uh, you know, if I wanted to photograph, I don't know, belly dancers, like, I don't know any belly dancers, but do you know a belly dancer? Uh, I might be familiar with one, yes. Right. So I could say, hey, Patrick, can you introduce me to some belly dancers? You know, and then when you call them up and say, hey, I got this guy, I know this guy, he's, you know, doing this project in belly dancers, then it's suddenly, you know, it's not trying to get your foot in the door, you're already in the door because you're with somebody who's, who's brought you in the door. And you, that, you got the seal. And that's, that's the easiest thing. And I, and so I'm uh, kind of working through the fraternities, okay. sort of like that. Uh, and with Armed America, it became a snowball. Like once I had like 60 portraits and I had a website. People were like, oh, wait, I know. OK, this is cool. Yeah, please come to my house. And I, it'll get there eventually with the, with the fraternity project. But I haven't been pushing it that hard because I'm working on other stuff. Always a million projects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes somebody will, in, invariably, whenever I go somewhere, somebody will come up to me and they say, I have a great idea for a photo book. And I'm like, I get five great ideas when I'm in the shower. You know? <laughs> what I don't have is time. <laughs> well, I, I want to circle back to that, actually, because um, we're going to talk a little later on about your, your next project, mm -hmm. which is uh, a photo book about payphones. Mm -hmm. And when I asked you why, are you, why are you doing a photo book about payphones, you said, 
someone approached you mm -hmm. and said, would you like to collaborate on a book about payphones? Mm -hmm. And your answer was, I've learned always to say yes in life. Mm -hmm. When did you adopt that philosophy and how has it worked out? I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm very happy you said yes to this interview. Mm -hmm. So, Well, sure. There, there's a, a precursor to that, uh, which is oh, surround yourself with creative people. So if you surround yourself with creative people, uh, whenever they say something, you know, whenever they suggest you do something, you just always say yes because you know they're creative people. And it's not like, you know, they're saying, hey, you want to come move my sofa? Right? It's going to be more. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like, hey, do you want to come to Boston and spend three days with the Dalai Lama? It's like, yeah, of course I do. It's, you know, it's, so good things come from saying yes uh, to your creative friends, which is, you know, why I said yes to this. I mean, obviously something good is going to come out of it. I, mean, I certainly hope so. Yeah. What was the most surprising thing about meeting the Dalai Lama? Uh, there were a couple things. Um, one is uh, how people view him in a way that he repeatedly tells them not to view him. Um, so when I, the first couple times I photographed him, it was event things. Mm -hmm. So it would be, you know, the Dalai Lama is coming to New York. He's going to spend three days uh, in this hotel and he's going to do a couple of teachings. And in between, he's going to meet, you know, some monks from this place. He's going to meet some monks from this place and some nuns and, you know, some other uh, people. So we'd, you know, go up to his room and they'd bring these people in and they would just throw themselves onto the floor. They just prostrate themselves. And he'd be like, no, just get up, just get up. You know, and like, I'm just a guy like you. He would say that over and over again. He's like, I'm just a guy like you. And there is this deep desire to make things magic. Sure. We, you know, like, like people would say, can you know, can you cure me? And he's like, no, I can't. I'm, like, I'm not a doctor. You want a doctor? I'm just, I'm just a monk. Um, so we want things to be magic because there, there are ways to do things and, you know, it's like, oh, I would like to, uh, you know, I, I would like to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and that's a difficult thing to do. But if you have a magic orb and you can, you know, suddenly I'm on top, mount, mount of, top of Mount Kilimanjaro, we want things to be easy. Right. You know, it's like, oh, I want to, you know, be a terrific uh, martial artist, but I don't want to study. Right. Not going to the dojo. Just want to learn it from the book. Right. So, you know, so he experiences that all the time with people wanting to make him magic or mystical or, uh, you know, somehow different than them, somehow like an actual holy person. Um, one of the most interesting things uh, that happened while I was with him, this is the third time I've spent uh, nine days with him, but the last time was photographing him. I was doing a portrait of him and I ended up having lunch with him and like six monks and they were all, you know, the heads of various monasteries in, in the United States. And one of them said, do you remember any of your past lives? And he said, and the whole table gets quiet. Sure. You know, cause like, here's the guy who can answer your question. Like, this is the question you've been asking yourself, you know, your whole life. Here's the guy who can answer it. You suddenly have an audience with him. Everybody stops talking. And he says, I had a very vivid dream once that I was a slave during the time of the pharaohs. And I was carrying heavy objects and I was dragging things. And it was very hot and it was sandy. And the monk said, was this one of your past lives? And he said, it was a very vivid dream. So he didn't know. Right. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't have the answer either. Right. So, you know, that was the most miraculous thing for me. And I did feel, um, I definitely had some sort of, uh, <sighs> I don't know, I don't want to say mystical feeling, but, you know, the, the, I, I felt uh, like something special was going on there. And I, and I imagine the way that I would feel if I actually stepped onto the set of Sesame Street or something like that or into the, you know, the Millennium Falcon or whatever. Um, you know, but there was something in me that was triggered by that experience. And I certainly felt like, oh, this is, you know, this is mystical. This is magic. Although, I, you know, he's telling me the whole time. It's not. <laughs> right, right, right. But I could certainly understand how people would just get carried away with that. I mean, just listening to you tell the story, it's clear that that was that was a very um, it was a very important moment to you. Mm. That, that's something you know, maybe not life changing, <laughs> but certainly you know something that sticks in your mind that yeah, you'll never sure. forget. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 
There are, I mean, there are things that change your life, and then I guess there are things that sort of, you know, prop up the sides of your life. And, yeah. You know, make it easier to go through, and that's, you know, something that occasionally will pop into my mind when I'm thinking about, uh, you know, oh, this is very complicated. Oh, maybe it's not. I don't remember what the Dalai Lama said. <laughs> so, I mean, you've, you've photographed the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. and uh, George R.R. R. Martin, mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, we could spend a couple minutes on the, the list of names of, of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have some pretty high-level stuff in your, your portrait gallery. Who's somebody that you haven't shot yet that maybe isn't as famous as all those people that you'd mm -hmm. like to shoot? Maybe be just because of their aesthetics or just because you'd like to talk to them while mm -hmm. you're taking their picture? Someone that's not maybe as, as well known as, as the big names you've worked with? Well, this is a bit of a double-edged sword because if I name anybody's name, they have to be, you know, uh, famous yeah, enough that I mean, people would know them. Um, let's 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 not say they're obscure, but let's say they're less famous than the Dalai Lama. A, a lot of times, somebody will say, "Hey, do you want to work on this project?" And I, and I'll think to myself, you know, you have to figure out how to spend your time. And I think, well, will this get me closer to making a radio play with Lance Henriksen? Because you know, that is something I would love to do. I'd love to photograph Lance Henriksen. He's got so much character in his face. But um, another person who I really, really would like to spend time working with is Nicole Blackman. Oh, yeah. Um, she actually, uh, we, we collaborated very briefly. Uh, back in the day, my record label put together a Pet Shop Boys tribute. Oh. And uh, she and... A gentleman who I'm really embarrassed, uh, his name escapes my mind right now, but they did a cover of West End Girls that was just very spare mm -hmm. and haunting and sometimes you're better off dead. <laughs> yeah, and, sounds like um, it. I, I had gotten hip to her because she was on a recoil track yes. called I Want, okay. which is just yeah. an amazing, amazing song. Yeah. So I'm, I'm familiar with her. So you, yeah. you, you, have you worked with her on anything or...? So, so this is weird. Um, when I did... John Van Eaton. That was the guy that she worked with. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. When I did the Who Killed Amanda Palmer book, mm -hmm. um, I spent four days, I think, in Boston with Neil and Amanda. And um, I was taking pictures. Neil was writing stories. And it was just this kind of like glorious grind that we went through. And throughout it all, I was listening to the Golden Palomino's Dead Inside kind of mm -hmm. on, on repeat. And in the credits of the book, I thanked her. I'd never met her, you know, but um, I really loved her book, um, Blood Sugar, uh, which I think is, pro I, think, I think she was the, uh, I don't know, maybe not the F. Scott Fitzgerald of my generation, but she was, you know, the, the poet of note of my generation. And that book was great. Her, uh, the Golden Palomino's album was great. So I thanked her on the, al on the book credits. And then, like, I don't know, like five years later, um, somebody forwards me this uh, message from Twitter. It's Nicole Blackman saying, who's Kyle Cassidy and why am I in the credits of this book? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I you know, messaged her back. And we sent, like, uh, you know, 50 emails that night um, back and forth. And I was like, oh, I totally want to do something with you. So I still want to do something with her. I would love to do a book where she writes poems and I take pictures, you know, so maybe I, you know, spend a week in New York just photographing her doing stuff. I mean, that is one of my, one of my big goals. I'd love to do that. I'd love to see, because, I mean, for selfish reasons, I'd love to see a new, new book of Nicole Blackman poems. And for even more selfish reasons, I'd love to have some stuff in there too. <laughs> It's a good reason to make projects happen. Right. I mean, I've, right. I've certainly right. made projects happen for selfish reasons, right. so I don't think yeah. there's any harm in that. Right. Every, I mean, if you do it right, everybody wins. Yeah, well, that's right. it. If everybody benefits and the product is good, right. Then, right. then why not do it? So um, another, another mutual collaborator of ours that I have to kind of circle back to, um, Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. we, we've both, both worked with Neil. Um, I did an album with him where uh, bands wrote songs about his characters and stories, and then he and I collaborated on the liner notes. And you've done a number of projects mm -hmm. with him. Um, what is it about Neil that keeps you going back to him? What does he bring to the table? Well, he's there are a few things. He's extraordinarily nice, and I think that's, that's the real key. Um, he's just the kindest person. 
And he also knows that he has a certain amount of cachet and that, you know, when he says something on Twitter, people, you know, a certain amount of people are going to respond. And he's very good about using that to be helpful. So uh, those are reasons. And then he also, he wants to help things come to fruition. Yeah. Know? He's uh, a facilitator. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, those are... Those are the three reasons. I mean, mostly, he's just so nice to be around. Yeah. He's, like, if you have this dream in your mind of what you hope Neil Gaiman is like, that's what he's like. I only spent a little bit of time with him, but I would have to agree with you. Yeah. Uh, we we uh, spent a little time together at a convention, and he wanted to take me into the green room to talk. And mm -hmm. one of the volunteers stopped him and said, this guy doesn't have a, pointing at me, this guy doesn't have a badge. He can't come into the green room. And... Neil was just very polite, and he said, well, I am the guest of honor, and I, I really would like my friend to come back with me. Is that okay with you? And the guy was like, oh, oh, yeah, yes, of, of course, Mr. Gaiman, please. And he will always be very nice. Yeah, he was. He was very nice about it. He will never say, you know, well, uh... I'm Neil Gaiman, right? <laughs> he won't do... He will, he will meekly leave before he will tell people who he is. So let's let's talk let's talk about uh, let's talk about the art of photography mm -hmm. and and the realities of what's happening in photography. Um, Canon just announced that they are out of the film camera business. Mm -hmm. They're done. Um, are, are film cameras something that are just going to be obsolete, like the fax machine, or is this something that's going to be more like vinyl records, where ten years from now there's going to be a resurgence of people who want the real feel of a film camera? Yeah, I uh, somebody loaned me a, a digital camera in two thousand and one, maybe, um, and it was an Olympus something or other, and the resolution was six forty by two eighty, something really small. And after playing with it for a day, I wrote this photo, this essay called "Film Is Dead," mm -hmm. and I, th I mean, it, it it took a few years for digital cameras to get up to where film cameras were, but I'm astounded that Canon, that Canon stayed in the business this long. I can't think of uh, any reason to have done that. Uh, and this is, this is very similar to an artist going in the studio saying, I'm going to record this on reel-to-reel -reel tape. Right. You know, I'm going to use tube amps or whatever. Um, it just makes things more difficult. But... It might give you the feeling uh, that you're doing something more fun. Well, when you started, mm -hmm. taking a photograph meant that you had a physical picture. You mm -hmm. had an object that you were going to wind up with. Mm -hmm. And beyond things like lighting and composition, you had decisions to make about how to develop the mm -hmm. photo and what kind of paper to put it on and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and now it's just all ones and zeros. And I mean, there's a million things that a pro like you mm -hmm. can do with Photoshop or a variety of other tools. But I mean, for an amateur photographer, the choice is what kind of filter am I going to slap on this before I throw mm -hmm. it up on Instagram? Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you, you miss about film or that you value about film or think it is superior to digital in any way? Or is it just a, a, a relic? There is nothing at all that I miss about film. Um, there are things that I miss about the film cameras. I don't think that anybody has made a camera as elegant as some of the film cameras, uh, which makes me sad in my heart because I don't want to spend, <laughs> I don't want to spend time with ugly things, uh, you know, <laughs> um, but they're trying. Um, and in the world that I'm in, any time that you spend uh, doing something you don't have to do is time that you've wasted, really. So any of the time that I wouldn't have spent in the dark room is, I mean, if it gave me nostalgia, it's not helping me. Right. Because, right? you know, in the end, I need to get the stuff out there. When I, I did an album cover for uh, John Carpenter, mm -hmm. and I brought a, a Hasselblad film camera with me. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm gonna bring the Hasselblad too. This is a perfect opportunity because you know album covers are square and the Hasselblad shoots square. So, you know, I shot a bunch of pictures of John digitally and then I was like, ah, oh, I get the Hasselblad out. And I shot a roll of film in the Hasselblad and that's still in my Hasselblad. And that, you know, 
that album is out, and there's a follow-up album out. <laughs> you know, he's, and the film is just toured. undeveloped, right, still in the camera. You okay. know, because when you know when the record company called up and they're like, "Do you have stuff?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll send you my digitals." And they're like, "Oh, this one's great. We're gonna use it." And uh, so, you know, so there's no reason, <laughs> no reason for me to like mix chemicals and like you know get that roll of film <laughs> out of that Hasselblad. And so that's happened a lot. Film has sort of become a write-only medium for me. I occasionally will shoot a roll of film and then occasionally never develop it. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's nothing I miss about it. But the, uh, what you're saying about throwing filters on it and, and the work that people do in the darkroom or whatever, none of that has really changed. Because yeah. in you know 1982 or whatever, when my mom shot a roll of film, she would just you know take it to the uh, photo mat and they would print it. But when you know, I don't know who Mario Testa or whoever is photographing in 1982 or Helmut Newton or whatever. You know, they would take their film and they would go in the dark room and they would spend, you know, or they would have somebody else do it. A lot of times, they'd have a professional, uh, a professional printer who would do this. A lot of uh, photographers didn't do their own dark room work. They would hire somebody whose job it was, and they were really good at it. But you know, they would spend however many hours in there working on this print in the dark room in the same way that. People are spending however many hours, or maybe less, um, working in Photoshop because it's easier to work in Photoshop, much easier. Because um, if you do something in the dark room, obviously, you know, you develop that print, you take it out, and you're like, oh, nope, too dark, you know, and it goes. And in the there's trash. no Control Z, you right, can't just undo right. it. Yeah, so it's you know back to square one. And there are uh, some pictures online of famous prints. Uh, with the markings on them made by the darkroom technician that show like, you know, burn this here for three seconds, this here for four more seconds, this here dodge for one second. And there might be 40 different markings on, on one print. So there's an awful lot of work that went into making just one of those prints. And now, you know, you can make endless <laughs> amounts of them. Um, so that's changed. Well, one of the big news stories this year has been something called deep fakes. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a process whereby um, artificial intelligence can take images mm -hmm. and audio of a person and create a video of that person saying and doing things mm -hmm. that they never actually did. Um, there's a fantastic one of uh, President Obama that a comedian did. Have you have you no, seen that I one? Seen that. I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It really it, it's indistinguishable from reality. Um, so. In that context of, of being able to create videos that mm -hmm. deceive, um, do you think people still trust photography or are they just going to look at any visual media that they don't like and say, fake news? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the first you know, fake pictures that I can think of um, were Alexander Gardner's during the Civil War. So, I mean, as long as photography has been around, people have been been faking things with it, and I, I think probably the most obvious one, and certainly the you know the most relevant for our conversation, is probably the Cottingsley Fairies. Right. In 1917, two uh, young girls in England uh, produced some photographs of them holding fairies in their hand and in the fairies in their garden, and when you look at them now, uh, they have flapper haircuts and they look pretty obviously like they were cut out of paper and, you know, hung from trees or whatever. But back then, um, a lot of people were uh, very, t believed them. A lot of people believed them. And famously, Arthur Conan Doyle, yes, writer of Sherlock Holmes, was like, oh, fairies are real. These, you know, these girls have photographed them. And uh, Eastman Kodak and Ilford, two f film companies, both examined the negatives and uh, were unable to uh, say that they were conclusively faked. So um, it's been happening forever, but as the fakes have gotten better, the forensic tools for discovering fakes have gotten better too. Um, in fact, recently the 2017 Wildlife Photographer of the Year was stripped of his award when they realized that his uh, photo was fake because it was it had used a stuffed animal rather than an actual <laughs> animal. You know, and what kind of animal? It was an anteater. <laughs> and you know, some some people who uh, thought this was a little too spot on 
<laughs> looking around some pictures of you know the local natural history museum, and they found the exact same anteater. Um, and then there, 2013, the 2013 uh, World News Photo of the Year came under some uh, fire for possibly being uh, manipulated, and I think many forensic tools were used on that. Um, and ultimately, it was a lot of sort of uh, darkroom stuff, dodging and burning type of things. But people were really all over that photo um, and spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what had happened to each, each pixel of it. The big problem that we have is that uh, people are losing their faith in experts. Mm -hmm. And so you have some guy who spends you know, three hours on Reddit and suddenly he's an expert on moon dust, but he can't figure out how to connect his printer, you know, and he's saying that, you know, <laughs> that Neil Armstrong's pictures were fake because he read all this stuff on, on Reddit. Um, and there are people who are actual experts in stuff, and there are people whose, you know, job it is to find facts and track facts down. And when you allow... Uh, the, uh, the belief in them to be sort of knocked out from under them, uh, it's hurting everybody. And that's how, you know, that's how fakes are going to hurt us. And if tomorrow uh, some really bad P-tape shows up on Reddit, there's a certain percentage of people who are just going to believe it. Right. Well, I mean, and, th and this is something I wanted to circle back to with you. I don't want to mangle the quote, but, a, you know, uh, what is it? A lie can get all the way around the world while the truth is still tying its shoes or something sure. to that effect. So um, it's great that there are forensic measures mm -hmm. to sort of take apart a fake photo and say, no, look, this isn't real and here's why it's not real. But by the time that happens... There's, there's a certain segment of the population mm -hmm. that's already seen the fake, digested right. it, decided that it's real, mm -hmm. and, and they've made up their mind about it. So for someone like you, mm -hmm. who expresses themselves artistically through this visual medium, mm -hmm. how do you worry about the impact that higher quality fakes have on your ability to make art and to, mm -hmm. to tell the stories you want to tell? We need to change the way that uh, news is rewarded. Mm -hmm. Because it used to be, uh, you know, something would happen at noon on a Wednesday, and you would have until the six o'clock news to get that story down. So, right. you know, people would be out there working for six hours, and then you would revise it for the, you know, the morning paper. And right now, if you're 10 seconds behind somebody, you could lose your news story. So people are going, people are publishing before they want to because they, they feel they have to. And uh, people are being rewarded not for having the right news, but by having the most compelling story. So, or the first story. So if I'm, well, if, if you know, I'm interviewing uh, somebody from the FBI. And they say, well, you know, we don't think there's a P tape, but we're going to keep looking. You could frame that as um, FBI doesn't think there's a P tape. Or you could frame that as FBI looking for P tape. So, uh, you know, one of those is going to get you more hits. And hits should not be the way that news is rewarded. Yeah. So accuracy should be the way that news is rewarded. Rather than, ah, oh, it's got a million views. And... You know, that's probably the advertising model uh, that's, that's responsible for that, but that really has to change. Otherwise, you know, I see people posting stuff on Facebook all the time from like, you know, a website called like supertruthfulnewssource.com. <laughs> you know, it's like, where did you get this? <laughs> yeah. From the super truthful news source, <laughs> duh. <laughs> right. So a another part of it is going to have to be that consumers need to be more aware of what they're doing. And we have to police each other. When you see somebody post something, you need to fact check that and remind them if it may not be accurate. Or right. at least, you know, it's like, here's some other th ways that you could 
you know, research this. And I try and do that, you know, every time I post something. I don't, I don't, always, I don't always get it right. Sometimes I'm too eager to share myself. But um, we, we need to uh, police each other. And I saw that Facebook now uh, has implemented some algorithms because I'll notice when, you know, one of my friends will post something, there'll be a sort of uh, uh, counterbalancing story that might come, you know, uh, beneath it or a, a fact check, something beneath it. And I think that should have happened a long time ago, but Facebook, uh, makes money off of you know people fighting about stuff. The <laughs> they more, certainly do. The more you are on Facebook because your racist uncle said something that <laughs> you need to you know correct him about. The more you guys are you know back and forth, and all of his his bar buddies are right. piling on, um, then they're getting money because they're getting your time. Sure. And they're getting you know your your eyes on your ads. Well, let's talk about let's talk about your projects. I want to circle back to this this payphone book. So. Um, you know, here's an object that used to be ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, and now, I mean, you know, crime is rampant in Metropolis because Superman can't find a place to change <laughs> clothes. I mean, they're, you know, find a payphone. I challenge you. Um, well, I wouldn't challenge you because you, you've clearly are. found them all and photographed them. Yeah. Um, so, um, I was in Manhattan talking to some people at a publisher about the payphone project that I was working on. And uh, one of them said, oh, if you see a payphone while you're in Manhattan, text me where it is because I want to show my son. And I said, there are 16 on this block that you work on. I know because I just photographed them all. So people walk past them all the time. And if you don't need one, you don't see it. It's invisible. It's become landscape. Uh, so... I'm collecting images of payphones. I'm collecting stories about payphones. Uh, uh, people who've used them, people who repaired them, people who worked on them, people who were uh, part of the manufacturing infrastructure for them. It's actually a lot more interesting than I might have thought it was going to be going in. Have you talked to any hackers that used to freak their free phone calls? Yes, in fact. Uh, yes. Awesome. We have talked to some hackers. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting about the payphones is that I think they come to reflect the neighborhoods that they have served. So uh, the ones in Manhattan, for example, are pristine. Somebody's upkeeping those every day. There's no graffiti on them. But you know, some of the ones here in West Philly um, have graffiti on them. They have stickers on them. They have an ad for somebody's yoga studio. Uh, uh, the handset might be smashed or maybe right. dented because somebody you know, maybe somebody was on the phone and got some really bad news, you know, and took it out on that phone. So for me, seeing each payphone uh, is being unique, is, is interesting. And I've just, I'm photographing them as I would photograph people like portraits. So that's been really cool. Um, just uh, last Monday, I interviewed Martin Cooper, who invented the cell phone. Oh, wow. So I think that's going to be the last chapter of this this book where he sort of, you know, he's the person who drove, you know, the biggest nail into the coffin of, of the payphone because it wasn't doing the thing that it should be doing right. the best. Right. Uh, so it's, you know, it's time had, had come. And uh, he was a really wonderful uh, person to talk to uh, about that because he's, he's an engineer, but he's a dreamer as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody wants to help make the world a better place. So that was a good place for that one to go. Excellent, excellent. Um, give us a little insight into into you, by way of telling us about the photographs that you have hung in mm -hmm. your own home. Sure. The photographs that I have in my house are a collection of stuff that I really liked, but also stuff that didn't sell at shows. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatic. Yeah. So I mean, you do a gallery show, and I do. Kind of less of them than I used to, but um, I still do them. And at the end of it, you know, you might have I don't know twenty pictures that hang up, and thirteen of them come back. Right. So they either stockpile in the basement or they go on the wall. Um, what I would really like to do is put up some hanging rails so that I can just sort of replace things uh, off and on. But I have. Um, Two of the pictures from Armed America mm -hmm. hanging up. Um, I have 
one, two giant pictures from war paint are hanging up. Um, That's the military tattoo, military tattoo book. book. Yeah. There's a giant portrait of John Carpenter upstairs because I liked that one. And then there's a lot of um, sort of family photos too, you know, pictures of me and my wife. And uh, my wife's family is, they had way more cameras than my family ever did because there's, you know, pictures of great grandmothers and great grand uncles and, you know, homesteaders in Wyoming and wow. stuff like that. So there are a lot of those pictures up around the house, uh, but also things, you know, occasionally things that I just thought like, wow, I did a really good job on that. There's a, a poster that I did for Romeo and Juliet a few years ago, mm -hmm. a giant version of that hanging up. Uh, there's a there's a picture of Amanda Palmer and her old band, the Grand Theft Orchestra, which I just thought was a really good picture and it never got used for anything. I'm like, I love this. Why has it never been on an album cover? You know, I'm gonna put a big one in my house. Um, and sometimes I'll see a frame at a yard sale or something, and I'll think, oh, that's a really nice frame. And that will be the impetus to like <laughs> get something printed and hang it up in there. There is um, a giant canvas print of a, uh, a picture they did for Heartless Revival, the, uh, the fashion design company of a woman in a dress with black feathers on it and a cloud of black feathers floating in the air. That's right at the top of the stairs. Nice. I mean, I guess it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go out and spend money on photos when you have so many of your own, but, <laughs> but do you have anything by another photographer in your home? Yes, we do. We have... What's my, your favorite? My wife and I have a, uh, have a, a no unoriginal art policy in the house. Okay. So everything in the house that's hanging in the house was is an original piece of art mm -hmm. by somebody, and it's mostly paintings okay you have a lot of paintings hanging up in the house there's a rachel best painting which i really like that's uh it looks like an old master it actually looks like a photograph itself of a woman burning a piece of paper that i really like there's um some science fiction illustration that we got um hanging up uh there's a bob walter uh drawing from a Asimov's magazine we have hanging up. Um, we do have, now that I think of it, we do have a, uh, one of those like, you look left, you look right, it's a 3D. Oh, okay, do the eyes move or thing, something? Or it's something a, like that? It's a picture of Martin Luther King from the, I don't know, it was probably made in the 70s, but I think to make it, they made a, like a model of him Oh, wow. And it lights up from behind. Wow. And that was something we, somebody gave us that, and it's actually pretty remarkable. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> but it's, it's, it certainly speaks to the 1970s um, and the, the interesting uh, desire that we've had for years to have uh, three-dimensional images. So that's what I got hanging up. So your most recent uh, published project was a book of photos of librarians mm -hmm. and, and kind of an homage to libraries, um, which was just a genius marketing <laughs> ploy to make sure that libraries buy their books. So I, I commend you, sir. That, is, that was a brilliant, brilliant ploy. Um, and I'm going to steal that from you somehow in some way in the future. Um, but uh, was there anything unexpected that that popped up in the creation of that book or any particular piece of, of wisdom that you came away with that really resonated with you? Yeah, the whole thing for me was unexpected uh, because I hadn't been into a library in a decade. Wow. In the time, you know, in the time that I started that project. And I think that a lot of people from my generation were the same way. Um, that it's, oh, if I need a book, Amazon will bring it to my door, you know. Right. Um, and I didn't realize how libraries had changed since I had been away. And it was really eye-opening and kind of mind-boggling, the, the digital things that libraries are doing. Um, and when I did that book, I did it not for libraries, but specifically for uh, your uncle who's sitting at the table at Thanksgiving saying, I don't want my tax dollars going there. What are they doing? You get your books off the internet, right? And for people who might be on a city council somewhere, 
or uh, you know might be in a position to to uh, have some control over the budget of a library, but mm -hmm. they don't know what the library is doing. So this is you know two hundred plus stories from librarians about what they're doing, plus essays uh, from authors about how they wouldn't be where they were if it wasn't for libraries. And a lot of the stuff that libraries are doing right now, and the, and the way that I interact with my library right now the most, is getting uh, audiobooks and ebooks that I can take out an ebook and get it delivered directly to my Kindle. Mm -hmm. I can take out movies. There's a, there's a, a service called Canvas that uh, has documentary films, like first run documentary films. But the audiobooks are kind of the big, big thing for me. I can probably take out an audiobook every week. Wow. And then there are libraries that have uh, maker spaces, 3D printers. If you need like a, like a washing machine. Really? Yeah. Let's say you need a washing machine part. You know, you need the thing that you know, holds the latch shut on your washing machine. And somebody's got a 3D printing design for it. It's like a 10 cent piece of plastic, you know, and you can just print it at the library if somebody's got the, the plans for it. That's, That's I had no idea. idea. Right, and uh, let's see. So there's one librarian I talked to whose li library only has ten books, but they have a recording studio. So if you want to make an album, they have <laughs> they have guitars, they have drums, they have keyboards, they have mixing stuff. Um, there That's are great. libraries that have high end camera equipment. So all this. There's one library that their main not book thing is cake pans. Because cake I mean, pans. Well, let's say you make cakes, right? And but you, you, there's a cake pan. It, costs, it looks like a skull, you know, but it costs $200. And you're going to make one skull cake. And then you're going to have this cake pan and you're, you know, I mean, you might make more than one I skull cake. I might make more than one skull cake if I knew how to bake. But you could, you know, take it out of the library and make your one skull cake, you know, and save the, save the space under your, your counter. So a lot of stuff like that. That's Tools. fascinating. There's a tool library wow. in West Philly. Or <laughs> <laughs> so many good jokes there that we're just going to skip right over. But... Uh... <laughs> All right. Well, we've we've got to wrap up. I've got a little musical shout out to mm -hmm. do. So uh, these guys really do not need my hype. They've got more than enough hype of their own already. But I have to say, it is entirely justified. The band is called Greta Van Fleet, and if you are a fan of Led Zeppelin, you will almost certainly love this album. Um, if you gave this album to me and said, "Hey, this is a lost demo from Led Zeppelin from way back in the day." I would completely believe you. Um, for fans of classic rock, they are definitely worth checking out. They're the next big thing, and um, I have been listening to it nonstop since I got it. So, Kyle Cassidy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching, and uh, please join us next time when my guest will be DJ, journalist, and musician Rodney Anonymous. Mm -hmm.